Today, we're gonna do a deep dive into speed ramping inside of DaVinci Resolve. I'm gonna show you how to use the retime curve in the edit page, as well as use the time stretcher node in the fusion page. And stick around to the end, because I'm gonna show you one extra saucy little tip. Let's go. All right, so we're gonna start with speed ramping on the edit page. If you already know how to do this, you can skip ahead using the chapters below uh, to go to the fusion method. Uh, I'm gonna be placing the master sequence below just so that I can replicate the exact same uh, clip side by side. Um, so let's get started. So I'm gonna drag down my exterior shot. I'm just gonna mute the audio. Right click it and hit retime curve. Once you have that open, now you're gonna hit this drop down. Here you can turn off retime frame if you'd like or you can leave it on. I choose to just leave it on because it doesn't really get in the way. Just make sure that if it is deselected or if retime speed is deselected that you hit the straight line because that is retime speed. Scrub into your clip, hit a keyframe. Closer to the end, hit another keyframe. Now you're gonna take the start, you're gonna drag it up. And then this little guy here, it's actually a slider. So you're gonna uh, slide it to the right or slide it to the left to uh, expand your view so you can speed around a bit faster. Let's go up. Let's drag it a little to the side, drag these in, drag these in. And we're starting to look like we have a speed ramped clip here. Uh, but I don't know where to speed ramp it to, so I'm gonna watch my clip and find where I need to uh, put my marker. So I'm gonna select the timeline because I don't wanna place the marker on my clip. I wanna place it on the timeline. And I'm gonna do that by hitting M. Now I know where to speed ramp to. I'm gonna drag this over just so that it matches. Perfect, that's looking great. Let's select the keyframes, hit this button to smooth them out. You'll get these handles that you can drag out to uh, just ease in your speed ramping. Enable it. It's gonna play back pretty choppy, so I'm gonna right click, hit render cache, and then top, at the top of the screen, I'm gonna hit playback and make sure that render cache is turned on to smart or to user. And then when we play back, we got our nice sequence. Looks like I'm just off the marker, so let's drag this keyframe over. There we go, first clip is done. Now we're moving on to a bit of a different clip. It's going into a TV shot. So it's gonna go forwards and then backwards. So we have to start on frame zero and end on frame zero. We're gonna open retime curve. We're gonna zoom out a little bit. Uh, we're at, gonna add a keyframe, just one this time. And we're gonna speed ramp the start of this clip. Drag it over a bit. And just gonna disable it just to see where I need to end this sequence or end this clip. Right there, add a marker. Okay, so now I want this clip to end roughly halfway in between these markers because I want to duplicate this clip afterwards and reverse it. I'm gonna add one more keyframe and turn the speed all the way down to 1%. Unfortunately, I can't go down to zero. 1% is the lowest. Let's smooth out our keyframes. Drag this over a bit. Let's go right in the middle and make sure that we're not playing 1% for more than we have to. So I might move it over just a smidge here, just like so. I'm gonna take my clip, Control B to cut it and then uh, delete that second portion. I'm gonna go into retime and scaling. I'm gonna turn on optical flow and speed warp better or faster. Just gonna use faster for now. Uh, this is just gonna make sure that our motion is smooth. Then I'm gonna take my clip. I'm gonna make sure my render cache is turned on. I'm gonna hold Alt and drag the clip to the right to duplicate it. I'm gonna right click the clip, turn it into a compound clip, which now lets me go into speed change and reverse the clip. Now, if we play this back, it's gonna be the exact sequence the frames are gonna line up. With this next clip, we have a little bit of an issue. Uh, in the sequence, the clip is reversing because we're coming out of the TV backwards, so we're reversing. But if we play this clip forward, you can see that the clip is actually pushing into the room. So we're gonna have to reverse it, and there's two ways to do that. The first is you can hit reverse speed change right off the bat before you open retime curve. Now what this is gonna do is it's gonna force you to work in reverse uh, inside of retime curve, or upside down, if you will. Because if you drag up, it's actually gonna slow down the clip, whereas dragging down is gonna speed up the clip. So we're gonna do that to the end. And then this bottom drag or this bottom slider is what you're gonna have to move over. And now for this next clip, it's the exact same issue. We have to reverse the clip, but this time I'm gonna do it in a workaround way. So I'm gonna open retime curve, just like always, and I'm gonna do my speed ramp. 
However, once I'm done my speed ramping, it's still playing in the wrong direction. So I'm gonna right click my clip, turn it into a compound clip, and then I'm gonna open speed change and hit reverse clip. Okay, and then once I'm done my entire sequence, so the rest of the clips are just duplicates that you have already know how to do now, I'm gonna change my timeline settings, switch it up to 4K, and I'm gonna render it. All right, so that covers all the basic speed ramping that you need to do on the edit page with the retime curve. It is a little bit limited. You can't go down to a 0% speed. Going from forwards to reverse is always gonna look a little bit choppy, but you do have access to uh, optical flow and speed warp, which are some huge assets to be using. Now we're gonna get into the fusion method, and then at the end, we're gonna compare how long it takes to do each of the two methods. So starting off is the same as the first method, I'm gonna place my master sequence at the bottom, just so I have reference of where I have to place these markers. But for the sake of you watching, I'm actually gonna use the music to place my markers because that is what you'd be doing. So I'm just gonna play the music and I'm gonna hit M every single time that uh, there's a beat or there's a snare or something that is impactful in the song. So we've placed our markers uh, in accordance to song and we're gonna listen, we're gonna play back and I'm just gonna reference my clip just to see if I'm lined up. Yep, that looks good. All right, so this one looks like it's just a little late, so I'm gonna move it back onto the cut. All right, let's drag our clip onto the timeline. And now this part's a little important, so let's make sure that we put our playhead right on top of the marker and then head into the Fusion page. In the Fusion page, I'm gonna hit Shift Spacebar and add the Time Stretcher node. It's gonna set an automatic keyframe where your playhead is. That's why I wanted to place it right on the marker. Let's go to the first frame of the sequence and add a keyframe for zero. And then I'm gonna check what the last frame in this clip is and it's 241. I'm gonna hit back on the keyframe so that I'm at my second keyframe and I'm gonna type in 241. This now plays our clip from zero, from frame zero to 241 in just 25 frames. It's obviously extremely fast. And then anything past that is just a replication of frame 241, which is useless to us. But we're gonna open the spline editor, make sure we have time stretcher selected. We're gonna hit this zoom to fit icon right here. Now we're gonna select both keyframes. You could right click this and hit ease and uh, select one of these predetermined uh, curves. However, I'm just gonna select both of the keyframes and I'm gonna hit S to add handles. And I'm going to be creating a reverse S curve. So the speed starts fast, goes slow in the middle, and then ends fast at the end. Now, if we go back to our keyframe and then go back to the edit or the cut page, we can hit Control B and delete the rest of the clip because it is completely useless to us. Now for the next clip, I'm just gonna show you what happens if you don't move your playhead on top of your marker and add the time stretcher node. So if we go into Fusion, add the time stretcher node, it's gonna add a keyframe. Unfortunately, it's not on one of our markers that we want it to be, but if we open the spline editor, you can see our timeline markers in there. We can drag it over, put a keyframe on our marker, and then just delete the first one that we added. By placing the playhead on the marker, it just saves a step because it automatically adds a keyframe. You don't have to delete anything else. Again, let's go to the last frame in the sequence, 160. Go back to our second keyframe and type in 160. Hit zoom to fit, grab both of them, hit S, create a reverse S curve, go back to the edit page, delete the excess. Now the next clip in our sequence is a little different. It's the TV shot. It's gonna start at frame zero and end on frame zero, going to the last frame in the middle. Add the time stretcher node, just like always, go to the first frame, add a keyframe at zero. And now the last keyframe, we're actually gonna leave at zero instead of changing it to the last frame in the clip. But we are gonna check what the last frame in the clip is. It's 120 and we're gonna plunk that right into the middle. And you can just guess for this. With the spline editor, now you have a very sharp peak. You're gonna select all the keyframes, hit S to get your handles, and you're gonna be creating a half semicircle. I'm just gonna move these markers to the side so they're out of the way. And let's see what this looks like when we delete the center keyframe. So I'm gonna delete the center keyframe because having any extra keyframes that you don't need is just a risk of causing some jittery motion that doesn't look as smooth or as natural. I'm gonna now select these handles and push them up. I want the last frame in the top right in the inspector panel to be roughly close to 120, but I don't want it to be more than 120 because that is gonna result in a black screen. So 115, that's fine. I'm gonna now go back to the edit page, delete the excess, play it back, and we have our clip. Perfectly smooth. Now we have to reverse this clip just like before. So I'm gonna drop it down, add the time stretcher node in the fusion page. It's gonna add the keyframe. And then the first keyframe, we're gonna add a keyframe. 
We're gonna check the last frame in this clip, 164, and we're actually gonna place that at the very start of the clip. So now if you open your spline editor, you're gonna see the clip is a reverse slope instead of a forward slope, which signifies that it is playing reverse. The same way, we're just gonna hit S, make a reverse S curve. Delete off the excess. Bang, nice. And lastly, we're gonna work on this counter shot right here. Uh, it's the same as the TV where we're gonna push in and push out. However, this sort of clip is playing in reverse of what we want it to. So when we add a time stretcher, it's gonna add a keyframe. We're gonna go to the starting frame, add a keyframe. We're gonna check how many frames there are on this clip, 114, and we're actually gonna plunk that in into the start and to the end. So now it's ending on 114 and starting at 114. And then in the middle, we're gonna add a keyframe for zero. And now we're just gonna turn this into a reverse semicircle. Making sure that the bottom of this semicircle does not surpass zero. All right, so we've done our fusion speed ramps. Now there's one more thing to touch on. Uh, on the edit page, you have access to optical flow and speed warp. However, using the time stretcher node in fusion, you limit your access on the edit page. So there's a workaround way to get some smooth motion uh, when you're going to a speed below zero or at zero, sorry. So let's open this counter clip. This slows down all the way to zero frames per second. So if we zoom in here, uh, currently it's on a frame blend mode. So what a frame blend mode does is it literally just crossfades between frame and frame. So as you can see, there's some ghosting happening right now. Uh, it doesn't look good at all. If we change it to near, so now it's just gonna be playing frame by frame. Uh, and that's gonna result in some stuttering motion, which is not what we're going for. Uh, but you can see how that cleaned up the image because we're not no longer using frame blend. And now the proper way to get smooth motion inside of Fusion is going to be using optical flow. You have to place this before the time stretcher node. Inside of the time stretcher node, you're gonna hit flow and that's gonna clean up the image. Just look at the before and after. Between blend, it's muddy. Between optical flow, it's back to clear. Now we're gonna do the same thing on the TV shot. We're gonna go before the time stretcher node, add optical flow. And one more thing that I forgot to say is you have to make sure that you hit clamp edges. If you don't do this, there'll be some weird black edging that's coming into your shot. Okay, and just like retime curve, we're gonna turn our timeline back up to 4K. Uh, I don't do this till the end so that I can have some smoother playback while I'm working on the project. All right, you learned how to speed ramp on the edit page using retime curve as well as speed ramping inside of Fusion using this time stretcher node. Now let's compare how long each method takes. Using retime curve on the edit page took a grand total of 12 minutes and five seconds and it only took 16 seconds to render the sequence. If we compare that to using the Fusion method, that took a grand total of eight minutes and 15 seconds and it only took 14 seconds to render. Now, generally I actually find that using optical flow instead of Fusion takes a little bit longer to render. So I was surprised that the render time was a little faster. Uh, so just hold that with a grain of salt. All right, so you've stuck around long enough for my secret tip. Now, generally with speed ramping, you're looking to add some motion blur between the clips. Uh, if we play our sequence right now, you'll see that there's absolutely no motion blur between the clips. I actually don't mind this look because it's a little cleaner. There's less mud that you're introducing into the footage. Uh, however, most people are gonna want to blend that or at least add some motion trails or some motion blur uh, to the clips. Now there's sort of two big methods to do that. There's one that's just adding the motion blur effect. Uh, that can be done either on the edit page, it can be done inside of Fusion, and it can be done on the color page. Now, Jamie Fenn also has a great method uh, using adjustment clips, uh, and it's gonna be using optical flow inside of Fusion as well as vector motion blur. It does look a lot better than the built-in motion blur that DaVinci Resolve offers. However, it's really computer intensive and it's it's hard to render. And when you're already adding, let's say, let's say you're adding optical flow and speed warp to slow down your clip, and then you're uh, rendering a 4K timeline, and then also adding that motion blur, often your computer crashes, it's frustrating. I don't like doing it just for the sake of that reason. So my tip is a little cheesy, uh, but to me it works and I think it looks quite good. Uh, so I'm literally just using adjustment clips here and the actual effect that's on them, believe it or not, is just zoom blur and directional blur. Now this doesn't blend the frames together at all. You could probably add like a slight crossfade to do that. However, what this does is it just adds a simple motion blur going into the shot. So this shot is pushing in. So I'm gonna add a zoom blur. Uh, and then I'm fading that in on the adjustment clip. And then for the directional blur, the shot is just panning from side to side. 
So then I just add directional blur, make sure that my blur angle is set to zero, depending on what angle I'm moving at, uh, and then fading that out. And when you play that through, it just adds a little bit of motion. It adds some kinetic energy to the video, but it takes absolutely no hardware power to uh, render that. And it's, yeah, it's, it's super fast, it's super easy. Uh, and I'm just trying to have a fast workflow, so that's what I do. Whew, that was a load of content. I hope that this video was helpful and informative. I hope that you learned something. If you guys like this video, please let me know down in the comments below. This is the first time I've ever made a DaVinci Resolve tutorial, so I hope you liked it. Uh, let me know what I should change, how I should change the pacing, whatnot. Uh, I'm not trying to waste any time. I just want to get right to the juicy stuff. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hit that subscribe button, maybe hit the like button, comment, who knows, whatever you want to do. See ya.